I think most people would agree that 2015 Cinderella is the most successful example of how a live action adaptation of a Disney animated classic should be done, which is kind of surprising because the director Kenneth Branagh tends to make films that are either mediocre or straight up poop. But Cinderella is just a luscious, enchanting, painterly storybook come to life in the most magical way. It's very traditional and simple in its approach, but effectively so, and it's faithful to the animated film, but chooses to view it through a more fleshed out, detailed, realistic lens, which of course is what a live action adaptation of an animated film should do. It should lean into the advantages and strengths of a more lifelike medium because it won't be able to as effectively recreate the more abstract impressionistic elements of its animated counterpart, as the animations can get away with operating on emotion rather than logic. And also, taking a more detailed, complex approach helps the live-action films feel more like companion pieces to the animated movies that exist alongside them as an alternative way to view the beloved story, rather than a replacement of the animated movie that just replicates it with realistic imagery and thinks that realism automatically enhances the experience when it's really just a different medium, a different way of telling a story. Anywho, Cinderella is pretty close to a home run. It's a few adjustments away from being the definitive example of a perfect Disney live-action adaptation. So, let's get into what I think holds it back from achieving pure perfection. I'm gonna start with what I would change from a visual and artistic perspective, and then what I would change from a storytelling perspective. So, let's get into the visuals. I'll begin with a decision that the filmmakers made in post-production rather than during conception or filming of the movie, and that would be the baffling choice to digitally alter Cinderella's dress color from icy, iridescent periwinkle that it actually was, to a gaudy, oversaturated royal blue. Yeah, the color pops more, but it also cheapens the vibe and takes away the ethereal, elegant, soft, romantic watercolor quality of the gown. And if they really wanted it to stand out more, they could have just increased the saturation rather than completely changing the color. It's still undeniably one of the most stunning costume pieces ever to be captured on film, and the costume design from Sandy Powell is probably my favorite of any film ever, so my grievances may sound petty, but these kinds of things do affect the overall atmosphere of the film and the impression you're left with. Especially because Cinderella in her gown is the main image of the movie. Having a central costume piece that is more hauntingly magical and sophisticated is ultimately going to evoke more highbrow feelings than something loud and aggressive. Also, the original color is more reminiscent of the animated film's gown, so it just feels more like Cinderella. So yeah, my first adjustment in my venture to make the perfect live-action adaptation is to stick with the original vision they had for the central gown. My next adjustment is more of a personal preference, but I guess everything in this video is. At the ball, I would have given Cinderella the updo hairstyle that she wears at the end of the film during her wedding. I don't hate the hairstyle she has at the ball, but I just think the updo would flatter her more in that pivotal moment, and it also, once again, would make her more distinguishably Cinderella. Which, yeah, I'd lean a bit more into the iconic imagery from the animated movie if I'm making the ultimate, definitive live-action adaptation. And that brings me to the fairy godmother, which is perhaps my least favorite aspect of this film. Now, I don't actively hate this version of the character, but I don't necessarily like the direction they went. I like Helena Bonham Carter, and I think her quirky, spunky, youthful take on the character is as best as it can be for what it is, and I particularly like the warm, comforting narration she does throughout the film but the character just works so much better as a nurturing, grandmother-like figure. 
Any other movie studio could have made a film with Helena Bonham Carter's version of the fairy godmother because she's so far removed from her animated counterpart. Why not embrace the Disney of it all? Isn't that the whole point? I would have had Julie Andrews play the fairy godmother as she would provide that sweet, gentle, caring energy and she's also a Disney legend so it would feel like a celebration of the company's legacy to have one of their most notable stars portray THE fairy godmother, the bippity boppity boo queen who is responsible for THE Cinderella moment. That would have been perfection and definitely would have brought a classical sense of magic to the film. So yeah, while having Helena Bonham Carter's version of the fairy godmother isn't a flaw, if we're making the best version possible, we're gonna go with Julie Andrews. And another strange creative choice that was made in the film was to go for a completely different design with the iconic Cinderella castle. And when I say iconic, it's literally the main Disney landmark, the main image you see before every Disney movie. It's the centerpiece of Disney World. So, while I'm by no means angry that it has not been interpreted to exist in a live-action world, it is an odd choice to fully ignore the iconography of it. So, in the ideal live-action version that we're imagining currently, I'd go with the blueprint of the original castle and make it more grand and sparkling than you can possibly fathom, because it just makes sense to have it there. Okay, here comes another adjustment I'd make that seems insignificant and petty, but we're making the stepmother's hair grey and her wardrobe color palette to mostly be burgundy, blood reds, and purples. Because while Kate Blanchett is perfect casting, and once again her costumes are incredible, I'd like to see a bit more of the animated character's DNA. She isn't the generic public domain version of the Wicked Stepmother, she's Lady Tremaine, the character created specifically for the Disney version, so yeah, definitely make her more distinguishable as such. And actually, I think it would be even more effective if she gradually started to get grey hair throughout the film, rather than having it from the very beginning, because that would contribute to the idea that she's envious and her youth is slipping away. It'd also bring out a more complex layer. If you only value beauty and superficial things, then you have nothing once that fades. That's exactly the kind of sophistication I want from a live-action film storytelling. And I guess that finally brings me to the storytelling. Now, it's obvious that the filmmakers wanted to address the complaints often said about the animated Cinderella, like how she's too passive, she gets saved by a prince, yada yada. Most of those complaints don't actually hold any weight if you actually look at the context. But having Cinderella meet the prince before she goes to the ball, before she even knows he's royalty, I think that was a good decision and a progressive addition. I really like it, and it's done very well and they have great chemistry. However, the other attempts to add a contemporary perspective to the story ironically make everything more regressive. This Cinderella is more passive than the animated character, even though they're trying to make her stronger. The animated Cinderella has always been unfairly criticized for not leaving her wicked step family and not rebelling against them, but she's a victim of abuse. She has no power, she has nowhere to go even if she does leave. She's just trying to survive her terrible circumstance. So, it makes sense for a live-action film to highlight and explore that reality to help people understand why the character isn't the damsel in distress people make her out to be. But they do kind of make her more passive in the live-action film. Not only does she lose some of her spunk and sass and attitude, but when she's asked by a villager why she doesn't leave the house she's being abused in, she simply says it's because it's her parents' house and she promised to look after it, even though she ends up leaving to go live in the castle in the end anyway. It's a flop of an excuse, to be honest, and um, 
it would have been much more effective and sad, honestly, if instead she was just venting to the mice in the attic and saying how she doesn't want to be mistreated, but if she defies her stepfamily, she'll be thrown out on the street and have nowhere to live. That definitely would have been a more powerful approach and a better explanation. And also, in the end of the animated movie, when she gets trapped in the attic, she tries to fight her way out. While in the live action film, she simply accepts her fate and doesn't even make a peep when she hears people arrive to the house. She gets saved on accident when she's heard singing, and it's really not a good look for her. She needs to be doing everything in her power to escape out of that attic. But speaking of singing, let's talk about how this is one of the few Disney live action adaptations to not be a musical. And as much as I would have liked to see some of the animated musical sequences in live action, I think being more grounded works in its favor. However, even though it's not a musical, there's still singing in the film, yet the songs are not any of the iconic ones from the animated film, and I don't like that. If Cinderella is singing a lullaby that her mother taught her, there's literally no reason why it shouldn't be a dream is a wish your heart makes that she's singing. I mean, come on, they totally fumbled there. Actually, this may not seem like the obvious choice, but I probably would have used So This Is Love instead of the Lavender's Blue song they used, because not only is it one of the most underrated Disney songs, but it can expand upon the meaning of the song if it was taught to Ella by her mother, then it would be about more than just romantic love or love based on physical attraction, it would also be about love based on the foundation of care and respect and companionship. So yeah, she'd be singing that. And the part where Drizella is horribly singing, there's no reason for her to not be singing Sing Sweet Nightingale. Which of course would be an earworm for Cinderella, so while she's cleaning, she starts singing it and we get an homage to the beautiful bubble sequence from the animated film. And the musical score is really beautiful, but I would have added a choir to provide heavenly vocals to certain parts to really drive home that classic Disney feel. And also some of the iconic songs that are missing from this version, we can add some instrumental references to them. Okay, those are the tweaks I'd make to 2015 Cinderella so that we can have the definitive example of what a Disney live-action adaptation should look like, because it's probably the best of the bunch, but still not a total home run in terms of adaptations. Have I missed anything? Probably, but I've got my main points covered, I think. Anyway, what do you think? Do you think these adjustments would make this the ultimate Disney live-action adaptation? Because I feel like we don't have one that is the ultimate example that we can point to and be like, yeah, that is perfection, that is how you adapt an animated movie. Cinderella is pretty close, but there are just too many tweaks to make. Anyway, okay, love you, love you, bye.